My guest this week is Heath Seifert. Heath is a writer and showrunner who has produced hundreds of hours of children's television. He and his writing partner, Kevin Coppolo, are known for creating and executive producing several shows, including Cousins for Life, Warped, and Austin and Alley. Heath and Kevin started on the original All That, where over six seasons, they created a multitude of beloved characters and sketches, including Good Burger, which they ended up spinning off into a feature film, and a sequel is due out later this year. Outside of writing, Heath has enjoyed a long side career in music, playing bass in several bands, including Backbiter, Magnet Hearts, Bronson Caves, and the Angry Samoans. And it is my great pleasure to welcome to Revolutions Per Movie, Heath Seifert. Hi. Hey, hey, Chris. Great to be here. Thanks for having me, man. How are you doing, you punk rocker? <laughs> I'm doing all right. Hanging in there. Uh, <laughs> Rider Strike is allegedly over. Yes, congratulations. Fingers crossed. It looks it, good. Yeah, and Amazing. when this airs, it will definitely be over. Yes. People, if if this conversation, if this part's in the podcast, the strike is over. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll just do it that way. I, I just have some questions before we get into the videos and of Weird Al Yankovic and UHF and uh, Weird the Al Yankovic story. Weird. You have written so long for children's television. Yes. How do you and Kevin know how to stay contemporary after all these decades in it? Because it just seems like that would be really hard to be able to <laughs> stay real. Sure. I mean, times change and styles change and what's the changes. Um, I, I think it helps that in general, we're very immature um, <laughs> and are able to put ourselves inside the minds of uh, six to 11 year olds. Um, I have uh, daughters now they're 15 and 14, but um, I see what they watch and respond to. And they've been like my own little uh, focus group, I'd say for the last five, 10 years, I, I could run stuff by them. Uh -huh. I, could, I could run jokes by them to see if they still laugh or not. Uh, and, but I do see what they're, what they and their friends get excited about or what shows they're watching. And I watch it with them. And I think that helps. And, and I think at the end of the day, you know, depending on what you're working on, but if we're working on a sitcom, you know, you're trying to tell a simple, good story with, movement and twists that has a beginning middle and end and you know that has some uh funny physical comedy along the way i think physical comedy is pretty timeless uh if it's if it's earned and it feels organic and right. it's not it's kind of like if you don't see where it's going a mile ahead uh you're gonna get the laughs out of that so we we like to build towards big physical comedy and a lot of the stuff we write and i think that's worked consistently is there any parallels between your life in punk rock and what you write? I, I think they're very different. <laughs> I mean, I, I do think like in the in at my day job, like you kind of know which people are into the cool music or have right. like a little music uh, side hustle going because uh, there are a lot of us but it's like oh okay hey all oh, that guy has a band too or or she's uh plays bass in this band and that's awesome and then we all kind of have this like we all kind of wink at each other like yeah i know but <laughs> it, as much as i would love I, I i guess in the punk rock sense when we were first writing for like all that 30 some years ago uh it was a little bit of the wild west and and there were no particular rules of what you were doing. I, I think the industry's changed a lot in that sense and things are a little more managed. But uh, at that time, Nickelodeon was just sort of finding their footing. There were incredible creative executives who uh, really just set the bar high for us in our career and who were very um, open to like letting us do, try stuff and like, oh, well, this is crazy. and you know not not that we were trying to be subversive and sneak anything in but we we weren't particularly focused on teaching lessons uh which i think a lot of children's television do, do does uh 
a lot of people like to write down for kids and we didn't do that we just said well what's funny what's crazy what makes us laugh um i think it's why we've been successful and i think there's some punk rock in doing that it was my authority i will tell you this when i told people that i was talking to one of the co-creators of good burger <laughs> the amount of people who were like losing their minds um, and how much that they were, you know, younger than me, but just how much that thing just was a total target into their heart and mind and soul. It's amazing. The reach of that. It's beautiful. I, I mean, it's a cult, got a great cult following and I love seeing the response to, to the film 25 years after we made that original movie. Um, people still love it. I, people come up to me now, you know, my, my daughter's friends are discovering it or their, right. or their friends, younger brothers, or it, it's their favorite movie. Or I see people having good burger birthday parties on Instagram. You know, it's like, well, it, yeah. it's amazing. Well, out of the gate, the film is definitely different, you know, than <laughs> most, most films aimed at teenagers. It's, it's, uh, yeah, it's it's definitely got uh, a, a very different sensibility. It's very untraditional, which I love. And <laughs> I weird. I, and it's weird. It's weird as hell, you know? It is weird. Yes. Well, let's... Well, oh, my God. I, that was unintentional. No, I promise you, everyone. <laughs> um, let's talk about Weird Al. When you were younger, were you a fan of novelty records? Did you have any of those k compilations? I did, and I... And I definitely grew up listening to uh, like Dr. Demento. Yes. Sunday nights here. Um, and I love the songs and I love that style of comedy. Um, I, you know, Weird Al came along somewhere in there, but there was a, a lot of songs. They would play the funny five at, at the end of the show. And right. I was on that. We, we would tape it. You know, we had our little Me too. We would tape it and play it back during the week and we would perform the songs and uh, oh, me too. Yeah. You know, and I think Steve Martin had some big comedy albums around then too, or maybe even earlier, right? That that was like yeah. and I think that was a big thing for us. Like we got those records and he had a you know, a song, you know, whatever, King Tut or something was Yeah, those comedy albums were also a bit of theater of the mind because sometimes you'd be like somebody's doing something on stage and you can't tell what they're laughing at. Sure. They're just, you know, and so you just in your mind would be like, what's going on? Um, but <laughs> when you just had a picture it in your head. Yeah. Yeah. But it's just, that was such a big market um, for the record industry was comedy records. But yeah, yeah, Do yeah. Dr. Domeno, you know, that was also where I first um, heard time warp from Rocky horror um, oh yeah, that's where I first heard "Blockhead" by Devo off their second album. He was yeah, there yeah. was pretty interesting choices. He played a lot of good eclectic stuff. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, we there was just dumb songs like that "Pico" and "Sepulveda," where they would just repeat that yes. over and over. And we lived about a mile from the intersection of Pico <laughs> and Sepulveda, so that felt very uh, like they were singing to us specifically. Yes. And the. Uh, Fish Heads obviously was a massive one that I feel like he was playing all the time. Barnes yes. Barnes. Yeah. Shaving cream. Oh yeah. Yeah. I could go on, but yeah, I had those <laughs> KTEL records. There was like wacky Westerns, Looney Tunes, funky favorites. Yeah. Yeah. No, we, we, and then I think we went back and got like the national lampoon had some albums. Yep. Uh, there were some Monty Python records that we, we bought at Rhino records on, Westwood Boulevard. Yeah, and it's funny it's in the new Weird Al movie um, that came out. You know, it's fabricated like massively, but there's a lot of truth <laughs> yeah. in it, and so it's it's really fun to just be like, oh, that really happened. Like recording another one rides yeah, the bus. Yeah. The bathroom stall for the echo. Yeah, with the with the uh, drummer, I think just hitting the uh, accordion case to to get the percussion percussion yeah there's great footage of him having his first national tv appearance in 1981 on tom schneider's show oh wow he's having uh it's all novelty stuff and you know tom schneider's he's just a weirdo yeah. already yeah. he's like all right what do you what's this song called al 
All right. I guess it's another one rides the bus. Here we go, everybody. Strap in. And then he's like, all right. Well, up next, you're going to want to hear this. This woman's got this crazy. So uh, yeah, yeah. seek that out because he does have the percussionist playing the suitcase. Yes. Yeah, he, and he's doing, is he doing like the weird sound effects and stuff as well? Yes. Yep. Doing all of it. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. The scene in Weird where he comes up with that on the, spot is pretty great it's just a template for you know the biopic you know yeah. unsupportive parents smashing the dreams rising to the top immediately winning <laughs> over audiences who don't understand them record label troubles addiction redemption and then at the end peace with your parents yeah that's all he wanted from the it, from the first scene in the movie yeah, yeah first scene in the movie is the parents telling him like you know we we think it would be great if you just stopped being who you are yeah <laughs> You're right yeah it's incredible well i remember yeah. weird al was just always around whether it was on dr Demeno or early mtv and his videos were really kind of masterful you know at that point where mtv was really starting to have more of a regular playlist and you you would get frustrated by seeing oh they're playing dire straits again or yeah you know I, i've seen this a million times um, this Duran Duran song, having Weird Al come in as much as it did was always kind of a relief because the parodies were so tight yeah, visually, too, that you were you would just notice things all the time in it that you had missed. Mm -hmm. And um, it is really funny that those videos created something that they reference in the movie as well called the Yankovic bump, <laughs> which is a real yeah. thing. Yeah. Nirvana said that their record sales really went up after his parody of Smells Like Teen Spirit came out. And I just love the idea of people being like, I, I want that, you know, like give me the ankle big bump. But there's so many artists that have said no, like Beck said no. Yeah. And you too. Prince, uh, Prince like repeatedly. Yeah, I know. And Led Zeppelin, which, you know, I get Led Zeppelin is very protective of the riffs that they stole from other yeah. people. <laughs> they let him use uh, like uh they let him use part of Black Dot in the middle yes. of one of the his songs though. Yes. It's yeah, pretty yeah. good. Do you have a do you have a favorite Weird Al video or song? Well, I mean, just from back in the day, you know, Eat It was definitely something that we took notice of. Um Yeah. I it felt big. It felt big budget almost. Yeah, yeah, and and obviously he was just riding the Michael Jackson train with Fat, um, but I loved that. I I do think uh, when you go back and watch a lot of the videos, there is a lot to to get out of them. There's a lot going on, yes. and uh, like I guess Easter eggs uh, as day to day. But the uh, I, I don't know. I I always enjoyed we we. Me, I always I keep saying we, but because uh, I always picture myself like with a close friend, like getting yeah, yeah. and watching these together. Uh, you know, I remember my friend Josh taped like every thing of Al TV. Every time he took over MTV, he would just videotape those, and then we would get together and watch that. And um, I remember having like a compilation that had like every video to that point on VHS and and putting that in and and watching that. He's made over 50 music videos as much of his career as anything. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I I have a couple that I'm really partial to. I I do have a soft spot for I love Rocky Road because his, he really loved <laughs> that early stuff hand farts. He loved yeah. using percussive hand farts. Yeah, let's see. <laughs> Now, see, I'm not a professional. I can't do it. But I just love that. It's like a hand fart solo here, you know? Mm -hmm. And then, oh, wait, it's a stereoed hand fart percussive part. Like, they're they're counterpointing each other, <laughs> like jazz. Um, Melodic. But I do remember when Smells Like Nirvana came out, that really felt kind of special because I was living in that time in, you know, like I was on Sub Pop at that time. And, yeah. you know, where everything else he was making fun of was they were kind of big hits, you know. Um, sure. And Nirvana, obviously, were big at the time. But it was nothing that I felt was, like, close to me. It was your, you were like, wait, maybe, maybe 
there's a chance Weird Al will pull <laughs> one of my songs now, right? That would be a dream no, come true. No, I don't true. think it was that, but it was just funny to be <laughs> like, oh, this this band Nirvana that like no one really knew about outside of the underground, you know, three months ago, yeah, yeah. is now ripe for a massive parody. And uh, and it's a good one. Very entertaining. I know they they got a lot of the same extras to be in. Oh, they did. Yeah, I, yeah. Apparently, a lot of the people that were in the Nirvana video were. Oh my there. god, that's amazing. I I remember at the time get seeing that flyer inviting people to come down and be in the Nirvana video. Um, I don't know what I had to do that day that was better than that, but I did not go. Did you have the proper um? hair length then because everyone in the audience like i had very long hair then i believe yeah straight Um, long hair they all looked like they walked out of the singles movie oh totally straight straight into it did uh cardigan sweater yeah or flannel i was flying the flannel for sure me too oh my gosh yeah it's yeah it's really funny to just go back and look and just be like yep i was a caricature (laughs) too I didn't know it. I lived in the Northwest. We wore this stuff, but you know, it was just like, oh yeah, yeah we all kind of were wearing it. <laughs> well, and it, and it was odd after, you know, it was like after Nirvana, like before a cry or, or AD, like so after Nirvana, right? And then you would go to like the Gap, and then they were selling flannels and this, and it's like, yeah, and then everybody was wearing them, and it was like, oh, what? Well, like I used, you know, you used to kind of know who the the punk rockers were and then now it's sort of yeah. everything had became so mainstream and it it was uh it was confusing i remember um the beastie boys opened up an extra large store in portland oregon mm-hmm. and so they had really expensive flannel with the extra large mm-hmm. logo on it and my friends um sam and janet who are in quasi mm-hmm. were running the store and it was just so interesting to just sit there and watch people shop mm-hmm. for this really expensive stuff. Nowadays, I think it's still hard to find cheap flannel. I think everything is just, you know, everybody, everything's just expensive, whether it's new or old. Oh, everything's but, expensive. Yeah. Yes. Except the except the budget of these Weird Al movies. Exactly. Oh, no doubt. Uh, let's let's step into UHF. Sure. I was a little too old for this film when it came out. Um, I remember it, you know, at the video store, it took a long time for it to come out on DVD. I had Mm -hmm. it on VHS, but it took a long time. But it is very classic of the time. Very airplane Zucker Brothers. A lot of parodies, you know, Indiana Jones. Very of the time. Yeah. Because he was also making fun of large big budget videos it was like now we get to step into movies yeah and you can see the thought process like it's clear oh like well okay he does these songs he does these videos it's huge it's like well what would a movie be it's like okay well you know there's a world where weird al can do these sort of sketches that are parodies of movies yeah you know and tv movies and tv uh you know maybe they were thinking this could turn into a a mad tv sketch show or something yeah um because it is very sketchy and and then there is sort of like a a your i don't want to say paint by numbers plot but it's like oh you know small company versus the big evil company and and uh yeah that that airplane humor was huge and and great and I, and was a big influence on me and i and i appreciate how broad everything kind of was broad and silly but felt a little dangerous um and i but it, airplane was probably 10 years before uhf right yes yeah so by the time you get to uhf maybe that kind of humor isn't as effective maybe you've seen it before I, I think one thing that's so effective in airplane is how straight everyone's playing it true you know you talk about like leslie nielsen he was funny in that movie because he was a hundred percent a playing it real not you know and 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 then you get to uhf and kevin mccarthy who i who i love great actor he is so big and so broad yes he's such a cartoon and and i think that might be the difference in uh, something like airplane and something like uhf 
Fran Drescher's in it and Michael Richards, John Paragon, I think is his name, who played Jombie. Yeah. yeah. And Emo yeah. Phillips, the Kipper Kids, you know, do you remember them from LA, the yes, performance yes. troupe? They're in it. Sure. Dr. Demento, of course. I love that when the film came out, Weird Al described the film as a cross between Son of Flubber, Sophie's Choice, and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And, Excellent. and to me, I'm like, yeah, it's none of those. <laughs> but but <laughs> but it is it has a it has a pretty great spirit to it. They're definitely all in. Oh yeah, and and they're the lovable losers, right? Yeah. They're the. It, I mean, I think that, and even the new movie, it's it's about like be yourself, be weird, the, embrace your weirdness, and it, I appreciate that. Transitioning from short form, like sketch, or these music videos, or twenty five minute television program and stretching it into a 90 minute feature seems like a lot of times that's really difficult to pull that energy and put it into a longer form. People talk about like brain candy or, you know, cabin mm. boy or sure. The, the strangers with candy movie. It's just hard. It seems to take. Well, if you're, yeah, maybe if you're used to working in more of a sketchy uh, setting to kind of try to, have enough of a story to hang all those funny set pieces on because the challenge i guess in any movie is you gotta still have some sort of drive for the characters you kind of have to have like obstacles and you want to have something so you're rooting for them and uh maybe with a lot of these movies it's like oh well here's no one cares about the plot here's like a thin enough plot that we can then use as an excuse to get into like these sort of one minute, two minute bits. And and when the bits are completely sort of unrelated to the plot, unrelated to anything that's moving any sort of plot forward, uh, that does that get old over 90 minutes? You know, um, I, we might be guilty of that <laughs> with a good burger, uh, <laughs> you know, again, cause it's like, okay, well here, like, here's a plot, here's something you care about. And, and, it is an excuse to get to these set pieces, uh, you know, in UHF, they're very much sketches, you know, un unless you're talking to they, yes, there's sketches that are on his UHF channel. And because they're so out there, they're bringing in the audience, which makes them competitive with the evil people over right. channel eight, whatever. But it does feel kind of like reading a copy of Mad Magazine from front to back. Mm -hmm. And there's some things that work and some things that you kind of skim over. And definitely, yeah. And again, in some stuff where it's, it's, you know, of the time, I think is the nice way to say it, but there's definitely some sure. caricatures and there's stuff that you wouldn't do today that, I mean, you know, yes. Weird Al wouldn't do today. I, mean, I, yeah. I don't know if you have the DVD or were able to watch any of the deleted scenes. Um, the best part of the deleted scenes is him in 2000 and whenever the DVD came out is him sort of narrating them or, you know, little clips of him in between the scenes uh, showing them. And he's always like, gee, I don't know why we cut that great scene. Like, and it's like, he's kind of, he's very self-deprecating and he's very charming and funny. And, and, you know, he, there's a reason why I think he is still is probably as popular as ever and and you know managed to remain a beloved figure by a lot of people and i i think it's because he's been consistently positive and good and and weird and and yeah and there's some stuff in the deleted scenes i think there was a longer version of it but they showed a quick clip of one of the a commercial for a show that was called like those two gays or something or uh, I forget what it was called. And yeah. you're like, okay. <laughs> They're probably really glad that didn't stay in the movie. Yeah. it it The film spent a lot of time in limbo when Orion went bankrupt and mm -hmm. really just found a life on cable TV and VHS. But there was there, and there's not a lot of music parody in it. No. And it's funny because, uh, yeah, the, I think there's one song. Yeah, really. The, the, they're doing the dire straits um, money for nothing. And Mark Knopfler only agreed to it if he could play the guitar line in the movie. I had heard that. And um, it's a great 
it's a great music uh, parody that works so well that it definitely once those things kind of disappear and you're back to the inner workings of the station and the drama they're trying to build up, it just kind of sags. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I, it's a, it's, it was a fun watch. I appreciate what they were trying to do. You know, I love Weird Al. I will officially say I like the movie, but I, I know it. Um, I, I mean, there's a reason why there's not a ton of, sketch movies right. there's a handful of them that you think of fondly or remember and even those you're like oh well that one sequence with you know amazon women on the moon right the groove tube bagley jr one was hilarious and you know or whatever or kentucky fried movie and they don't make a lot of movies like that and and i think in terms of like a parody movie right so like weird al does his parody songs and kind of has a uh, corner on that market because who else is going to come along? And I mean, people do funny songs, but who else is going to really come along and do parody in any meaningful way? Right. Um, but there, there are these guys who kind of, you know, have taken the airplane baton and run with, Oh, now we're doing, now we're doing scary movie and teen. And some of them are scary movies were pretty funny. Put Chris Elliott in anything. And uh, it's going to up the ante. So on a scale from one to 10, with one being the lowest and 10 being the highest, how many hand farts do you give this <laughs> film on a scale from one to 10? Uh, let's see. I can't do it. Uh, I, <laughs> I can't either. Let's, let's give it a uh, 6.2. That's the correct answer. That's the right. And that little squeak of the last hand fart. Yes, yeah, two tenths of the hand fart. The little point two is like, it's a little air. It's 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 lovely. I was blown away by Weird, the Al Yankovic story. I was really excited to see it. I love the casting, mm -hmm. Daniel Radcliffe, who I love. Did you see Swiss Army Man? No, I hear that's great. It he's amazing in it. Um, it, I guess it was originally based on a 2010 Funny or Die um, short. Right, they did like a fake trailer, right? Yeah, with um. Aaron Paul. Aaron Paul, right, as Weird Al and Gary Cole and Mary Steenburgen as the parents. It's yeah. great. You know, Pat Oswald as Dr. Domeno. Same same director and writer, Eric Capel, who's yeah. done yeah. like Eagle Heart and The Office and Brooklyn 999. Brooklyn 999. Um, mm -hmm. That's what the real heads call it. We don't call it 99. Brooklyn 999. Brooklyn 999. Is that what the nine heads call it? The Niners. And I guess at that point, and Weird Al's stars in it again as a record executive. Um, but they really struggled getting funding because the studios wanted a airplane style film. <laughs> and it's like, well, we did that. We were talking about this, that, you know, there might be a time where people look at this and this will age in the same way UHF has in terms of like, oh, that's that funnier die style humor. It's like, oh, the straight parody with like, you know, pretending to be fiction, pretending to be factual, but right. like going in really odd places. Or... Yeah, walk hard, things like that. Yeah, which is great. Ooh, I hope somebody picks walk hard. That would be a really fun one to <laughs> do, too. No, I haven't even thought of that. I hadn't seen the fake trailer uh, before yeah. this. And so I really didn't know what it was going to be. Mm -hmm. um, and I really did think it was going to stick to some sort of truth in a weird way. I was really naive about it. Some more truth than Eric does. But I love that he just took all these amazing elements from The Doors, yeah, Bohemian Rhapsody. It's just beautiful the way he weaves it. I think it's it's there's never a dull moment. The casting's amazing. It looks great. They shot it in 18 days, which is incredible. Yeah, I think both these films, when you kind of read up about them a little bit, they're both like, okay, yeah, you're a weird owl. Like you're this huge, massive, successful video maker. Uh, well, you could do a movie. If you could do it for one tenth of what a normal movie costs in one tenth of the time. It's like, okay, cool. Like, yeah, right. They did it in 18 days for what? 5 million or something. Yeah. It'd be really amazing to be in a contract negotiation with weird Al. I have no idea what his energy would be like. Because yeah. he just seems so kind. And I mean, he's obviously super talented and smart. Great with his legacy and everything. He's really protective. I imagine he turns it on in the room. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, yeah, it depends. Is that meeting with the executives that 
that aren't seeing it and need some convincing you know, as you bring his accordion in and yeah. get up on the table and dance. You know, I, I find uh, bringing a guitar into a pitch helps a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've done that many times. Really? Yeah. Well, me and uh, Kevin, we'll, we'll write some really goofy songs when we're trying to pitch right. something. And we, you know, we sold a Christmas movie and we wrote all these like fake, I don't know, like, uh, wrote a vegan christmas anthem called soy to the world uh -huh. and performed that and you know stuff like that can we talk a bit about the pitch situation during the um the strike i was reading a lot about just the state of the industry and and you know what some of the changes were needed but the idea of just going in to sell your idea is mm -hmm. is that hard to do still for you it, i mean we've been doing it so long that i kind of i don't want to say we have a template for like oh here's how we'll get into this and here's what we're, we're going to say about this show right um but we've done it enough that you kind of know the drill i it's not my favorite part of the industry i like writing i like producing i like being on a set or i like being in a room by myself, <laughs> right. uh, going in and having to kind of turn it on and and be an entertaining person for half an hour is, is uh, you know, it's not supernatural for me. And, yeah. and so maybe in some of those pitches with the guitar, that's almost like a safety security blanket to have this here. Like, I know they're going to respond to this. I know they're going to do it. And uh, there's a physical instrument between me and the people I'm talking to sure. to protect me, right um but yeah no we we have it down and it's interesting because I know that's something they talked about a lot in strike negotiations and I don't know what you can do about it I don't know where you land on it but for every you know job you get you probably spend months coming up with something and tweaking it and honing it and you spend weeks and hours going into places and pitching stuff and and for every everything we've sold we've probably pitched 10 things that have been rejected you know um and so that's a lot of work that you're not making money on right uh, and you often can't use you know we, we uh we got pretty deep into pitching our take on like a hong kong Fui movie once and uh it was an interesting experience and we were told that we were the runners up when they finally like hired someone to do the movie but everything we came up with was for hong kong Fui. we're not like oh we'll use that in austin and alley now it's, right. it's, it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't quite work that way yeah yeah runner up in this in this game doesn't seem uh like a good yeah um thing to fall fall into you know for sure so. it but uh, it's it's always an, an interesting experience, and and you you do learn stuff. Right. Incredible casting with Toby Huss uh, as the father. So good. I always loved Pete and Pete, and he was uh, Artie. Artie, the, uh, yeah, the world's strongest man. Is that right? That is, is that what his yeah, title was? Yeah. And I I got to see a Pete and Pete reunion. Oh, fantastic! About. Eight years ago, and he was there, and he was a maniac. Oh, really? Really? Like, in person. Toby Huss was just, because he came from, like, performance art background, but it was just definitely from a darker, yeah. stranger world. And then he gets hired in this children's thing. He was just, that, that night was not for the children. It was so great. It was, he was so amazing. And whenever he, again, he's one of those actors, whenever he's in something, I'm just like, oh, it just, I just feel like it's better yeah he just elevates it because he 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 just plays a good weirdo and a great hard ass he he is so perfect in this movie and at that <laughs> at that role yeah somebody who's just horrible to his kid write a passage in these films yeah and of course at the at the end you learn that he secretly wanted to play accordion and you know you know all this is going to happen. There's mm -hmm. there's no spoilers really. We're going to say because it is a a, a template. Mm -hmm. It's universal truth in these films where you always find out that your father always loved you and he was secretly a fan of your music or your art. Um, he just never told you. You've seen it a million times. <laughs> but 
you know, there are some truths in it. You know, uh, Thomas Lennon shows up with the devil squeeze box to sell him. Yeah. That is how Weird Al did get his accordion. Yeah. Apparently there was a door to door salesman. I think selling lessons. I don't know if he was selling like instruments, right? It was, I, yeah. Give him a choice of like uh, accordion or piano. And did you ever take music lessons? Uh, not barely. Barely. I took piano lessons for um, like a minute and i remember i grew up with a piano in the house and i was always figuring stuff out by ear and and i think my parents thought oh well let's get him some real lessons uh and a teacher came in and um was trying to show me some real basic stuff and i think i was already sort of capable of playing harder stuff just from what i taught myself so it was a little like challenging and uh, and i remember she wanted to show me some classical piece or something and i said you know can you just teach me some kiss songs and the ne- you know next time she came back and she showed me this beethoven symphony that was basically the same song as like great expectations from kiss destroyer and it, which i think what a brilliant <laughs> lesson she, and she was trying to show me like That's look cool. it's rooted in see that melody and what i was like oh that that's amazing that is a brilliant lesson but i don't want to learn the beethoven song he just teach me the kiss song and then i right. got upset and packed up her stuff and yeah. left and i never saw her again <laughs> i i've always enjoyed playing by ear i've always enjoyed just kind of winging it and figuring it out and uh you know when i was first even just trying to play bass i just remember being at in someone's garage and these people were jamming and there was just a bass sitting there and no one had picked it up and I didn't know what the hell I was doing, but I was just like, put it on. It was like, well, I'll figure out, I'll figure out what they're playing and play along. And I somehow did. Uh, and it was great. Never looked back. That's great. Mine was, um, I had a bass guitar and there was only one other kind of weirdo punk rocker in my high school. And he invited mm-hmm. me and my brother over to his bedroom. He had an electric guitar and my brother had a snare or something like that. And he's like, do you know, religion by public image limited and i'm like uh-huh. yeah and i didn't yeah. i had never heard it <laughs> and it's only a few notes but i was just like yeah I, I, of course yeah i know it let's do it. i wanted to do it so badly that i yeah. just was like yeah 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 um <laughs> the the speaking of teenagers and music that great scene in this film of the teenage polka party the, the underground polka party sneaks out of the house to go to <laughs> is brilliant it's so great they're like teenagers walking around being like i like like whooping john wilfart and his <laughs> mini minnesota sound that's where yeah. i'm at like he really brings it and uh i just thought was uh so funny and and just so well done the person who plays the young weird owl the different yeah yeah you know there's a couple there's a of them are were really great being like the peer pressure to like Come on, yeah. play your accordion. You say you know the accordion, and you know they they egg them on by doing the chicken dance. They're like, "All right, chicken," and it's just awesome. And then, of course, the cops busted. Oh cops, yeah, so everyone scattered. I, I love the idea that we could live in a world where, like, that's what the teenagers are sneaking out of the house to do to to crank polka albums. I know it's so great. And then, of course, the confrontation with his parents. He has a great quote where he says, one day I'm going to be the best. Well, perhaps not technically the best, but maybe the most famous accordion player in a very yeah. specific genre of music. Yeah, there's a line, I think, I think it's near the end where he's talking about, like, the satisfaction of being up on that stage and having people singing along with your words to other people's music. There's so many great scenes in it because they're all iconic tropes yeah and then it's sort of like a slow burn right because it sort of starts with like okay like yeah the okay his parents are his dad's mean they're not really supportive the jokes are maybe a little uh, like on the broad but yes you but maybe it's still a real story at this point right and i think uh, one of my friends we were talking about it and he said he was like watching the beginning of the movie and he was like Oh wow, you know, I never realized Weird Al had a dad that was such an asshole. Like same thing. Like totally believing like this is such the true story. And then it goes out the window so fast. And then by 
two thirds into the movie, Madonna is being kidnapped by Pablo Escobar. <laughs> it's yeah. I, I had the same thing where I was like, oh, right. Yeah, this is <laughs> yeah, hard, you know, like he just had crappy parents, you know, um, who are just not supportive. But then again, the little truths come in, like that scene you mentioned earlier where he comes up with my bologna. Right, my bologna. And he, he makes a sandwich for he and his friends. And it's just that thing, the bologna is on the counter and it pushes into his eyes and it pushes into the bologna and it pushes into his eyes and it pushes into the bologna. So well shot. Like, the, the, yeah, that it's just such a slow push in yeah. the bologna. And then I think the song My Sharon is like actually like on the radio, but it's like skipping. Yes. So it's just doing that one thing over and over. Yes. They comment on the fact that it's skipping and uh, it's it's handled so well. And I love they're just like, how did you do that? Is this the devil's energy or God or they're, they're just blown away. And I, I guess Weird Al did meet the lead singer of The Knack who told Columbia that they should put out his parody and did. Yeah, that, that was his first release right yeah his life is kind of full of these weird there there's a lot of things in the film that are kind of like based on little kernels of truth like oh yeah the knack being like him getting support out of the gate through dr domino getting radio airplay and being heard nationally and then being on television on tom snyder and then having columbia put out his stuff it's kind of a, a for somebody who was just doing this stuff on a whim um it is kind of a rapid ascension. He he really fell upwards, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, he picked... <laughs> I mean, if you're going to be like a successful mu musician, I don't think like the career path is like, oh, I'm going to do accordion. I'm going <laughs> to, you know, but he, he found it. But in, and then, you know, he wears his influences on his sleeves and that is Dr. Demento and Mad Magazine. Um, and uh, the world was ready for it. I mean, there's a perfect storm of i think early mtv and you see a lot of the musicians that became massive almost overnight like because of videos and he was kind of there then right yeah. so he he had the music thing cornered but it was really the visual medium that probably propelled him to that superstardom level the musicianship is quite good like Phenomenal. the choice of how to do a solo of a song whether it's going to be kazoo mm -hmm hand farts, accordion. I'm always kind of impressed whenever I hear them just how well played they are. They're not, the, the content is obviously jokey, but just because it, the instrumentation is a little different, it, it still is pretty like full on. You take it for granted, but I think that's almost his secret weapon is I, I, he's a genuinely good musician. Yes. He's a great, a great singer. Um, and and the band is able to pull off a lot you know we we've seen them live many times uh and it's always entertaining yeah it's always a really great show uh, i i think musicians in general respect him and like him i think comedians like the comedians that kind of are the cool comedians all like him and respect him uh he hasn't made except maybe with the exception of coolio hasn't really pissed off that many people right his life's pretty uh scandal free I, I know like there was the behind the music on him and you know you, you watch like the motley crew one and it like needs to be like a nine hour episode and then you watch the weird owl <laughs> one and it's just people going like i love like the only thing any, anything bad anyone could say about him is like i love everything he did but the version of my song he did i didn't think was that fun like I mean, it's about when it's your song it just feels weird right yeah, they're like, I had a better idea for the lyric than he had. Yeah, I thought it was going to be something funnier. but Yeah, I mean, it's it's apparent. I mean, you know, Jack Black is in this and Conan O'Brien and Paul F. Tompkins. Well, just the casting just in that scene alone. The pool party? The, that party scene is just remarkable. And, and the people that are there, like Divine and Grace Jones. Yeah, Pee Wee Herman, Elton John, Devo, Tiny Tim. Greg Zappa, Salvador Dali. Warhol. It's a total Boogie Nights feel. That is, that is one of the best scenes. It's just so good. They got Rain Wilson to to play Dr. Domeno um, instead of Patton Oswald because Patton Oswald had broke his foot. So they just got him three days before. I think he's 
really great in it. Just captures. He is great. It's like it's not a Colonel Tom Parker relationship he has with Weird Al. He's more supportive and kinder. He's a surrogate father figure for sure. Yes. <laughs> yes. And, uh, you know, whether he's, you know, putting acid in his, you know, food to <laughs> yeah. take him on a journey to open your third eye or yeah. or just the slow clap of being like, you got it, kid. I knew you had it. I mean, I just know Dr. Demeno on the radio, right? I know yeah. his voice and his, his his lunacy, but I don't know anything about him as a human being. No. And I thought it was really <laughs> great that they plucked him out and they made him such a pivotal character in it. And he's important in Weird Al's life, and for real. We know that, and and I'm and I know the real Dr. Demento's in UHF, right? Yes, he is. Uh, does the real is the real Dr. Demento in Weird? I would imagine he has a cameo. Uh, I don't know if if so. I didn't notice, but yeah. let's just say yes to be safe. Yeah, we'll it probably seems yes. safe because he's in like I, I love Rocky Road, and he's in a lot of yeah. the music videos, the videos and stuff. So yeah, I think he's in there. I just have to really look hard, Heath. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry you missed it. Uh, Patton Oswalt's in it. Patton uh, Oswalt yes. does get broke, maybe even with a broken foot, does get a cameo. Weird Al plays uh, a record executive. The Scotty Brothers, right? Him and, and Will Forte. Is was that the name of the label? It, that really was the label and the that he was on, right? So yeah, I imagine they were that mean to Weird Al <laughs> in real life to his face. No. And I and there is an and again that's another one of those like sort of like self aware things. That, like Will Forte starts going off on uh, Daniel Radcliffe as Weird Al, and like, but then starting getting, like personal, like your stupid hair and your stupid mustache, you know, and then. Weird Al playing the other brothers, like, oh, okay, I think that <laughs> yeah. he's like going a little far there. But I do imagine there was a conversation at some point where people were like, <laughs> why would people want to listen to this parody thing when the original is so great? And I, I don't know whose idea was because, yeah, in those early Weird Al songs, it is like accordion, hand farts, hitting this. And then at some point, I think they made somebody said, hey, why don't you bring in a real music producer? Yes. Right. And actually produce this like real, <laughs> like real music. Uh, but that definitely was a, a pretty huge evolution in his career. Yeah. And original songwriting, too. I mean, he goes on tours now playing his originals. Right. Right. Which are in the style uh like he does the what is it, the pastiches like dare to be stupid was an amazing oh no it's devo parody uh, era thing it's just it's the sequencers on it are amazing and the video too he nails it well that was one of the takeaways from seeing him live too it's like oh this guy can like has a such a strong voice that he could belt it out he uh i imagine i like to think he has really good taste in music but you know you don't you might never really know. I saw him do a really odd surprise uh, guest spot right when the Pixies reformed. Uh, Frank Black, Black Francis, put together this benefit show at the uh, Echo. And uh, it was basically the Pixies playing a surprise show minus Kim Deal because she had previous engagements. So it was like a bunch of guest bass players throughout the whole night doing like all Pixies covers with different guest singers. So all of a sudden in the middle of the set, it's like, Oh, here's weird Al to sing. Uh, I bleed from uh, Doolittle," And he sang it just totally straight, totally re like, and it was great. It was one of the best uh, songs of the night. I, I think he will be looked back on and, and maybe, I don't know this level, but the way everyone talks about Dolly Parton right now, like maybe in 20, 30 years, people are just going to be like, yeah, Weird Al, man. Yeah, I think so. It's only grown. And I think people just have to give him his due. I think that they're just, it's just the talent is there. The other great thing about the film, he writes Eat It before Beat It yeah. is written. So right. he's like, I'm writing original stuff. And so he writes this song, Eat It, and they're like, oh, you can write original stuff, too. You're so great. And then Michael Jackson's doing a parody yeah. song, Beat It, and he's losing his mind. He gets the, the character gets it becomes such a sticking point to him that it, it really causes him to unravel. Like yeah. That's what sends him down this like spiral of drinking and 
anger and and he's so pissed that like people from now on are always going to assume that eat it is a parody of beat it not the other way around i wanted to ask you about this moment actually in screenwriting what would you call this a oh a, a technical like yeah it, it's like your uh your obstacle right your second act like i i don't know if i know the official term we have like weird nicknames for everything you but we would probably call that your second act uh twist right we we always try to get to a point where th the story takes like a left turn that you maybe don't see coming that's set you on your final ultimate journey to redemption uh but that is a great example of that yeah because it's classic it, it, i mean in a funny way you don't see it coming because this weird owl but his descent mm -hmm. you know descent into um, addiction and falling in with Madonna and her using him, wanting the Yankovic bump and and that great scene where he's doing the Jim Morrison uh, speech that got him arrested yeah. in Florida. And it's in Miami. He's like, you want to you want to see it? Want to see <laughs> it? He's talking about the accordion, but it's too late. It's so. And I like right. that the band like sort of sees where it's going and they sort of start improving this sort of like little yeah. Dorsey psychedelic oh, riff. It's so great. And Daniel Radcliffe is ripped. Like, you know, his shirt's off. He's got like a six pack. He's so good in this movie. I think it I think it won an, an Emmy, right? Or or it was nominated. It's it's nominated for eight Emmys, including uh Best Actor and Best Screenplay. And I think Roku made a decision to submit it for Emmys as opposed to submitting it for uh, Oscars. Yeah, yeah, because it didn't play theatrically. And I think, don't you have to, you have to have a theatrical run for it. Yeah, I'm sure Weird Al somewhere was thinking like, you know, this could be my Oscar chance. Yeah. I, I think if you stick through the whole credits, the song, it's one of the original songs in the movie uh, that he wrote for the movie. The lyrics are very specific about what's happening in the credits and he's talking about wow are the credits still going on i can't believe it okay the song's going longer uh and i think it one of the lines in the song is about how hey this is technical this song technically could get nominated for an oscar if it, you know can you believe it or yeah. something like that it would have been great to see barbie versus weird would be a pretty amazing oscar year you know oppenheimer Weird, yeah. Barbie, the 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 stuff with Pablo Escobar really comes from outer space. Yeah. Do you know the story about him holding a band hostage? No. So that's a real that's ripped from the head. Yeah. So I guess in real life he had this Puerto Rican salsa singer Hector Lavoe mm -hmm. um, perform him and his orchestra. He had him sing over and over again his hit song El Cantante um, while threatening them with a gun. And at some point, he just said, we're not doing this anymore. He, oh, wow. They locked the band in the basement of his compound. They broke out through a window and escaped into the jungle to safety. Wow. See, now that's a movie I want to see. Yeah. And so I, <laughs> I was like, why did they do this? This is really, it's funny, but it just, it's very random. It's I, There are worse things to be held at gunpoint and forced to do, I imagine. Totally. But Play that, song again. that story must have hit their ears at some point. And they're like, all they right. They must have, yeah, they must have had that stored in the file cabinet somewhere. <laughs> exactly. And like, hey, what if, yeah. I, I mean, I, I bet there's a pretty nice list of like just rejected storylines and paths that this could have gone. I can only imagine. Yeah. Both uh, Weird and UHF have similar sequences in a sense of that, like the escape from Pablo Escobar uh, or, you know, coming in to rescue Madonna is what I think he thinks he's doing at the point. And then at the end of UHF, the scene where he's going to rescue Michael Richards character all of a sudden becomes sort of a Rambo parody. And, and so both scenes sort of have a shirtless buff weird owl <laughs> flying through, you know, running through the jungle with, with a, rifle or machine gun or right. something. Uh, so there are parallels. It was nice to go back and watch it 
again because I did see it when it first came out and, and enjoyed it thoroughly. And and I know when you first uh, reached out to me about talking about a music movie, it's like, oh my god, there's so many fantastic, great movies, and instantly, like off the top of my head, just like shot back a, a an email with like, oh, you know, the unheard music and uh, Quadrophenia and 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 we went back in blank generation or even rocky heart and, yeah. and it's like they were like okay yeah yeah those are all great and i think we narrowed it down to like quadrophenia or uhf and we're like oh okay, yeah yeah and like i i have so much i could talk about quadrophenia for six hours you know and sure. then we're like okay yeah yeah do uhf and then we went and i think we both went back and watched it we're like oh there's oddly like no music in this movie. yes <laughs> there's the one video in the middle and it's it's yeah, it's Weird Al, so it's music adjacent for sure. No, but it was amazing that you even thought of UHF. Not, I mean, or Weird Al, because that would have not really crossed my uh, mind. And then it was just so obvious. There's there's so much to talk about with him. Yeah. You know, as a screenwriter, is there, what is it called? Where you uh, punch up a script? Is that what it's called? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. We, yeah, I mean, is there something that you could be like, oh, this would have been kind mm -hmm. of a fun little thing that's a rock and roll film biopic moment that wasn't covered oh interesting i i uh i hadn't thought about that angle at all um i feel like a lot of the uh rock movies have some personal tragedy in them like they're sort of responsible right. for the death of their friend or or something like that right like uh, johnny cash had a like a horrific playground incident or something. Right. And, and so maybe there would have been an opportunity in, in weird to, to find, you know, he causes the death of a bandmate or something in some ridiculous way. It is, or, or, you know, had a twin brother that we didn't right. know about who died at, at a young age. Right. Yeah. Uh, so maybe there's something there. Well, for the sequel, hopefully. Uh, I, I also think it'd be really fun to see Weird Al tackle an entire concert film like Russ Never Sleeps or <laughs> Stop Making Sense and just tear <laughs> apart like a 90 minute. What are the tropes of a concert movie? Yeah. Yeah. I think it would be really fun to see him do and then just, you know, jam all that in, whether it's, you know, Beyonce's Homecoming all the way to, you know, um, uh, like the last waltz and like yeah the rehearsing getting up to it special guests yeah yeah uh, you know who would you cast as like the very over excited uh martin scorsese doing his interviews with the band backstage <laughs> when they're shooting pool and stuff and talking it's like ah, oh, yeah that'd be i'd love to see him tackle that kind of a, a paul schaefer arty fufkin uh Yes, totally. Be great. Weird Al would have been great as Artie Fufkin. Oh, he would, man. you know, yeah. So, you, you, not to take anything away from Paul Schaefer. Yeah, yeah. No, you, you, and you do see Weird Al doing a lot more cameos and stuff these days. And uh, you know, a yes. lot of the stuff I've worked on when we've had like opportunities to incorporate music or go after music guests, all that always had music guests. It was always like the top kind of R and B artists of the day, and I, and I was always like. Hey, let's try to get weird. And every but everyone was always like, no, no. <laughs> was always like Aww. secretly. We we uh we worked on a show called Stripperella for a while, and we did have like this one episode that sort of parodied like an Ocean's Eleven, and we had this villain Cheapo who just did really small time cheap crimes like counterfeiting pennies and robbing 99 cent stores. And so we did have an episode where he like did an Ocean's Eleven thing and got together a group of villains and we just kind of panned the table of villains and we went down and it was like blah 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 Weird Al blah, blah, blah. like but we just stuck that in there it was it was our finally I I got to put him in something but I don't even think he knows that exists <laughs> so it, wow so did you did you have to get permission to no I don't think we ever got permission so right maybe uh maybe we'll get sued now. <laughs> No, I don't want this to be known for that. So we already talked about UHS score. So on a scale from one to 10, mm -hmm. how many hand farts do you give weird the Al Yankovic story? 
I'm going to give weird a nine. Nine is the correct answer. That is perfect. I got it right. I know how you did it, but you two. got it right. I have it right here. It's nine. You're right. Excellent. Excellent. So the only thing I didn't say that I, that when you brought up Pete and Pete, I do just want to say that The Adventures of Pete and Pete is a fantastic show. I love it. Will and Chris, who created it, are awesome dudes. Uh, Danny Tamborelli, who played Little Pete, is still a dear friend of mine. Oh, wow. And a bass player as well. That's amazing. I knew he was a musician. He played at the uh, the live event I went to. Oh, okay. Yeah, with his with his band Jounce. I think so. I think so. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, they seem like really level headed, lovable people who are kind of they've kind of moved on, but they're also like we're we we're, we're so happy we got to be part of this cool, um, strange TV show. Yeah. Uh, it again, it came out of that really great time at Nickelodeon, which I think of as like kind of the heyday of Nickelodeon. So, Oh yeah. Anything that has like Chris Elliott, Michael Stipe and uh, Sid Straw. He pop was on it. Yeah. It's just the, the cast is, I mean, it seems like there was a period at Nickelodeon where maybe you, you weren't being watched as much. Like they're like, just make your stuff. Yeah. You were, what well, was, you were encouraged to try things. Everything didn't have to like kind of fit in a neat little, box of oh well here's what works here's what you know our we did our our testing and here's what 11 year olds want to see and or disney has this hit so or whatever disney and nick right do this to each other it's like oh that show's doing well we need our show that's like that or you know it was sort of like, oh it was a little bit of an anything goes yeah a lot of the subject matter on that show was very old timey too so uh-huh. it wasn't now at all or of the moment that's what kind of made it great like oh my grand my grandfather's into bowling and he's got this bowling ball that's really special or we're gonna spend time with a, a meter reader yeah um and it just and a lot of time in school he so great to see you i really appreciate this this was so fun thank you so much for having me on it's been fantastic talking always great talking music with you and uh just since we didn't talk about quadrophenia we'll just i'll go Little ocean sound effects. (laughs) That's my that's my uh, attempt at parody, everybody. So thank you very much. Thanks again so much. Awesome, man. Peace out. Bye. Thank you for listening to Revolutions per Movie. We release new episodes every Thursday, so be sure to search for the show on your favorite podcast app and subscribe to the show. And if you've enjoyed this, it would mean a lot to me if you would rate and review it as well. You can follow us on social media at Revolutions Per Movie and also find out more information about our various guests in the episode show notes. Thanks again, and we'll see you next week. Bye.